Hello everyone and welcome to this video tutorial in which we're going to be doing some A-level law revision for contract law. In this video we're looking at the topic of intention to create legal relations in contract law and looking at an essay or an evaluative type question that could come up on this area. So this particular question asks you to explain the presumptions that are applied by the courts when considering issues of intention to create legal relations and analyse the circumstances in which those presumptions may be rebutted. So in essence, this question is asking you to analyse and evaluate whether the different rules and presumptions that the court has developed on intention to create legal relations, whether they're fair and logical or not, in sifting out cases that aren't really appropriate for legal action talk you through a suggested answer how you could go about tackling this to maximise your chances of getting high marks on this question. As always, I've colour coded the suggested answer. So black represents the first assessment objective where you are demonstrating your knowledge of cases, rules, principles. And the red font is where you are analysing and evaluating the law. And I've also highlighted cases so that they stand out. So you always want to start an essay question like this by making sure that you've defined the area of law that the question is asking you about. So this answer has started with, in order for there to be a valid contract, there must be intention to create legal relations. And then I'm straight into some analysis and evaluation because I'm saying that the purpose of this requirement of a contract is to sift out cases which are not appropriate for court action. Because, of course, you'll know that not every agreement that you make in your day to day life leads to a binding contract which can be enforced through the courts. For example, you might have an agreement to meet a friend at the park. You might have a moral duty to honour that agreement, but obviously you don't have a legal duty to do so. And that's in general because parties to such informal social agreements don't intend to be legally bound and the law seeks to mirror the party's wishes. That's provided a nice little introduction as to why we even have these rules and presumptions on the intention to create legal relations. And then we can start to get into the actual rules themselves. So in order to determine which agreements are legally binding and subject to an intention to create legal relations or not, the law draws a distinction between domestic agreements and agreements made in a commercial context. And I'm going to start talking about some cases that help to explain these distinctions and these rules. So in Edwards and Skyways, it was held that agreements made in a business context raise a strong presumption that the agreement is legally binding. And this meant that a redundancy agreement could be enforced against an employer in this particular case. And then it's nice to try and evaluate what's gone on in that case. So the presumption in favour of intention to create legal relations in a commercial context does seem fair because it's assumed that parties intended an agreement to have legal uh, consequences. So in a business context, in this case, it was employee employer and the will of being a contract of employment. It's fair, it's logical. Everyone expects that those agreements should be legally binding. And you could further illustrate that point with the case of SO Petroleum. And it's useful here, although we don't always talk about facts of cases, it's useful to briefly outline them for this case because it helps to illustrate the point. So in SO, SO was giving away a free World Cup coin with every four gallons of perch petrol, sorry, purchased at its pumps. Millions of the coins were distributed. Customs and excise tried to claim that the coins were being sold and it could therefore claim purchase tax from them. Since ESSO was trying to gain extra business from this promotion of getting free coins, there was an intention to be legally bound by the agreement. And this means that offers to give away free gifts to promote a business create a presumption in favour of the intention to create legal relations. 
And again, we need to try and evaluate and say whether that's a logical rule to have. So I've put here that it seems fair that if a business is potentially getting a financial benefit from a promotion, that they should also be bound by the terms. Now, some might argue that it seems harsh, actually, that there's a strong presumption in favour of being bound in commercial settings. However, that rule is sort of tempered, if you like, by the fact that the presumption can be rebutted. And so we could talk about the case of Jones and Vernon's pools. And in this case, it was held that commercial agreements can rebut the presumption that they are legally binding if they specifically state it is not binding. So again, useful just to outline very briefly some facts here that in Vernon's pools, they managed to avoid creating a binding contract by simply stating that the transaction would be, quote, binding in honour only. And that seems fair because the clause was clear, the customer would see that, it was incorporated onto the coupons, um, so it seems like a, a fair case. You could talk about the similar situation that cropped up in confetti records, where the use of the phrase, quote, subject to contract on a document acts as an exception to the general rule that commercial agreements are, are intended to be legally binding. So on the face of it, then, with our commercial settings, it sort of looks pretty fair and straightforward. We've got a general rule that there's a strong presumption that you are going to be bound. And that seems fair because that's what people expect. That's what people want when they enter into contracts, presumably. However, we can get rid of um, some harsh cases that that rule might create by saying that a company can, as long as they make it clear enough, avoid that intention to be bound. So let's contrast that with the rules for social or domestic agreements. And in these sorts of agreements, there is a presumption that the parties did not intend to create a legal relationship. And that rule is illustrated in the classic case of Jones and Padavatin, in which an agreement was unenforceable between a mother and daughter because it was merely a family agreement and therefore it was not intended to be binding. And in terms of evaluation, we can say that this is a logical presumption to have because it'd be absolutely ridiculous if every single agreement between family members could be enforced in the courts. Non-lawyers may find it difficult to imagine a mother and daughter suing each other. And in the case of Jones, it was described by the judge as a, quote, really deplorable situation. And then it's useful to contrast the cases of Balfour and Balfour and Merit and Merit. And you may have come across these cases when you've studied distinguishing, um, but they're useful in this topic as well. So in Balfour and Balfour, there was no intention to create legal relations where an agreement was made between a husband and wife who were happily married at the time that they'd made an agreement. Again, that seems like a logical decision because it would be impractical to expect the courts to intervene in every agreement between a husband and wife. But that doesn't mean that there can never be an intention to create legal relations between a husband and wife, as illustrated by merit and merit. There can be such an intention where an agreement is made after a husband and wife have already separated. And he could further discuss merit and merit and say that it was fair in this case because there was also a written agreement which showed an intention to be bound and this was made after they'd already separated. So you can clearly distinguish merit and merit from Balfour and Balfour. And it would have been inequitable or unfair for the husband to go back on this written agreement in the case of merit. And it's nice to consider Wilson and Burnett next, because we've considered family members with Jones and Padavatin. We've just considered the situation with husbands and wives. Now we're going to consider the situation with friends. So in Wilson and Burnett, the defendant won over £100,000 playing bingo with two friends with whom she worked. 
Now, the friend said that there was a prior oral agreement made at work that they were going to share any winnings. But this agreement was unenforceable. Notice that it's an oral agreement, there's nothing written down. And the court held that there must be certainty and clarity to rebut the presumption that social agreements are not intended to be binding. And the judge in that case said, quote, the reality is that the claimant's bare bones account of what they say was agreed at their place of work scarcely stands as an agreement binding and enforceable in law. So in other words, there's no contract that the courts can enforce here because it's just a couple of friends saying that some other friend said something um, once while they were at work. You know, it needs to be clear. There has to be certainty to rebut that general presumption. Let's look at a case where it has been rebutted. So the presumption is rebuttable by contrary evidence that the parties did intend their contract to be legally binding. The burden of proving this is going to lie on the party seeking to uphold the contract. And we could discuss Simpkins and Pays here, where a lodger entered a competition with two members of the household. They each paid in on the understanding that they were going to share any winnings. The agreement was enforceable because this time money had exchanged hands. So that didn't happen in Wilson. There's just some account of a promise um, that there's no real record of. But here there was um, an exchange of money. And you could say that it seems fair that where parties have exchanged money, the courts are likely to believe that there's an intention to create legal relations because the payment of money makes it more akin to a commercial agreement. And we can reach a conclusion here by summarising um, the presumptions on intention to create legal relations. So I've got here, the presumptions on intention to create legal relations are important because not all agreements should result in binding contracts and the presumptions help to identify where a binding contract should be formed based on whether the parties intended there to be legal consequences. And it seems to be the case that they are logical presumptions to have and they can be rebutted, which does seem fair on the parties um, so that they can make sure that only contracts that they want to be legally enforceable are so. So I hope that video was helpful to you. I do have other videos on my channel on contract law and intention to create legal relations if you want a little refresher on all the key cases and the law in this area.